Ladies and gentlemen, buckle up. If you're already driving, I hope you are already wearing your seatbelt. What I am about to show you in this video is nothing short of absolutely sensational. It is currently day number five of five at the Superbet Rapid and Blitz chess tournament being held in Warsaw, Poland. At least today it is. Whenever you are watching this in the future, I hope you're having a great day. Going into today, Magnus Carlsen, greatest player of the current generation and arguably of all time, is behind in the standings by two and a half points with nine games remaining. And the person in first place is Chinese superstar Wei Yi. And what I am about to show you will shock you, fascinate you, potentially inspire you, or frustrate you, because none of us, we will ever, ever get close to this level of greatness. None of us. Not even close. We could combine it. It's not going to happen. Sit back, relax, and watch one of the greatest duels between two chess players who are trying to win a tournament. I'm speechless. Absolutely speechless what has just transpired. At some point, Magnus won 10 straight games. 10 straight games against 10 different players. Not 10 different players, but at least 7 different players in a double round robin field has like, it's unfathomable absolutely unfathomable what has transpired. They are playing five minute blitz with two second bonus time, which is actually relatively long blitz. His first round opponent is Kirill Shevchenko, and we will go back and forth as Magnus and Wei Yi battled for one of the most unbelievable photo finishes in a chess tournament in recent memory, except maybe the candidates, but that wasn't rapid in blitz. So Kirill Shevchenko, originally from Ukraine, now playing for Romania, uh, opens up against uh, with Magnus, and Magnus plays whatever the heck this is. I mean, this is essentially trying to take some punches, right? Hiding behind the guard and, and trying to land some back. So we have knight to f3, knight f6. Magnus going for the queen side, counterplay with the move b5 because it looked like white wanted to castle queen side. We have a3, bishop g7, Kirill goes for the dark squared exchange and then he castles queen side. From the early opening, it was only one man who could have an advantage and it was Kirill and he sacrificed the bishop to punish Magnus's wrongdoings. CB knight b5, oh my goodness, this man Magnus is on the ropes already. His king is trapped in the center of the board and he's only in his underpants. Queen c5, like Derek Lewis, by the way. Anybody saw that? That was unbelievable. Knight to d6 check, king to e7, knight g5, he is swarming, but you gotta beat Magnus three times in the same game to put him away. You can try to just get aggressive and open things up, but let me tell you something. Magnus, Magnus senses there is no more attack here. White needed to be a little bit more accurate and suddenly white is down two minutes and that's basically 40% of your starting time. Queen e3, queen f4, there's no more attack. In comes knight to g4. And it's only one man who is going to perish, and it is the man playing with the white pieces. Kirill keeps sacrificing queen f5. What a classy move. You take the queen, Black's knight takes the white queen. That is what we call a desperado sacrifice. And when the dust settles, all of a sudden, there is a fork. Black has three pieces. White would remain with two. Kirill resigns. This one was over in a flash. It was bad for a moment. It was very dangerous for a moment, but he needed to make a significant investment in order to get to Magnus. And here what Kirill had to do is just play it slowly. He had to double his rooks, build around this knight, but it's really tough to do. And ultimately it is complicated. He tried to bulldoze Magnus and uh, yeah, that's not, that's not how we're gonna get it done. So a first opening win, but way he won too. Magnus has nine rounds to cut a two and a half point gap. That's really, really, really hard. The only way to do that is to literally win every game you play. All right, so we're going to play a Bozo Indian. Uh, this is actually called the Bogo Indian defense. Uh, it's uh, it's B-O-G-O. I don't know, I, but I like to call it the Bozo Indian defense because I, I because Bozo is like the best word ever. All right? It, it, call your friend a Bozo. All right? In any case, we have Bishop to B4 check, the Bogo Indian being played uh, by Prague, and Prague beat Magnus. <laughs> so, so Prague already beat Magnus once in this tournament. Magnus plays knight d2, a3, takes, takes. We have d5, we have b3, bishop b7, bishop b2, right? Bishop b2, and very simple, very, very normal game, very, very, everything calm, right? a6. And here, Prague for some reason gives up the bishop for the knight. He does that to damage Magnus's pawns, but. Are, are you sure about this? Clearly, Prague thinks he knows something about the position that we don't quite understand. Magnus Castles, he doesn't even play rook to g1. 
and it's bishops versus knights. So Prague pushes back the bishops. He's looking to take one of the bishops. Prague has had incredible success against Magnus in this tournament. He is playing very well. And now we have queens and bishops versus queens and knights. Who's going to win? Uh, I got to tell you, probably the guy that has a two and a half minute time advantage in a blitz game. Queen c7. G6. Now a4. Uh-oh. 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 It's like letting a guy get into his zone. He's getting into his groove. Takes. And now look at this. Bishop c4. Now the queen has to go somewhere, but the queen can't really go anywhere because this is hanging. And if you go over there, I have queen d8, queen e7. So he plays knight d5, queen c8 check. Black's position is spinning out of control. He's stuck. He has eight seconds. He goes here. But queen a6. And the problem is, if you trade the queens, I have what's called an outside pass pawn. It's the worst pawn to have. Like, for the defending side, because you, you gotta... It's really, really difficult to defend it. Knight b6, and Magnus just does exactly what he does best. Picks up a couple of pawns, bishop to b5, a5, and his king is safe, and the knight is getting pushed back, and the knight is stuck, it can't move anywhere, the pawn is going to promote, queen e8 is a threat, Prague resigns, that's two up, two down for Magnus Carlsen, and I spoiled a little bit, because he kept winning literally every single game he played, but it was unreal the way he was getting it done. Now, here's a game with the black pieces against Nodjebek Abdusatarov, who is a world rapid champion. Nodjebek is also the player that Magnus constantly cites as the future of chess, among others, among some of the Indian talents. Uh, Nodjebek is the youngest, second youngest ever player to win a world chess championship, all right? This one is a, uh, whatever the heck this is. I mean, this is like an early e5. He doesn't let Nodjebek play d4. So now we get into a slow and, 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 and maneuvering game. This is a uh, symmetrical English where both guys have moved their c and e pawns to squares. So the corresponding um, squares on d5, d4 are going to be up for grabs. It's going to be a big maneuvering battle. And now look at this. Look at Magnus. He allows the pawn to go to h5. Not only that, he lets the freaking pawn go to h6. Alpha Zero style, computer S style. He's like, come get some. Come get some. Bishop F6, D3. Both guys moving their queens out of the way of the pin. We have a trade, Knight E2. And now Knight H2 looking to target the bishop. Very close, but how's Magnus gonna break through? He's not possible. How's he gonna do it? F4, right? Takes, pawn takes. Okay, give a check. So what? King D1. He's safe. A5, trying to anchor the knight. Nodjebek tries to kick out the bishop. Ooh. Uh-oh. Now, the reason you couldn't do that on the last move, by the way, you couldn't play bishop f2, uh, is because I would have stopped you, and then I would have moved my knight, and then I would have gotten your bishop. But the second that you do it this way, with knight f3, it's like you tied your shoes together, and now the bishop is going to live there, and that's all Magnus needs. He plants the bishop on that e3 square, and now castles. Nodjebek tries to trade the queens, but now uh, black is arriving, and it's really, really difficult to defend your position. Knight goes back to c1. Magnus grabs the pawn on h6, the pawn that Nodjebek had put there so long ago to take space away from the black position. Knight back to c6. And also today, Magnus was playing much faster. So he has just sort of been a little bit slow and then ultimately gets himself into a situation. Like he said yesterday, he's bad with low time on the clock, but 53 versus seven, very winnable. Unless Nordjebek defends like a genius, rook h1, Magnus causing him headaches and problems all over the board, rook to f8, he's now, but, but, but Nordjebek fighting. Oh my goodness, Knight takes g6 here, was apparently nearly back to equality, but it was very, very tough to spot. And ultimately, king a2 is played. And I, I guess Nordjebek just resigned because he was gonna lose this pawn. Um, and then, uh, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe he ran out of time there, but that's where the game ends. I mean, ultimately, Magnus is up a pawn. He's going to win a second pawn. Um, maybe not right away, but, uh, because he would lose the pawn on g6. But in this position, yeah, king a2 was played, and, and, and that's the end of the game. So maybe Nodjebek lost on time. Um, maybe, uh, he resigned. I don't know. Uh, but three up, three down. Three up, three down. You know who else was winning games? Wei Yi. We have a London from Gukesh. Gukesh struggled, by the way. We're going to talk about that later. He ended up in last place out of the eight players or ten. Ten players. He ended up uh, in, in, in a last place spot despite having a lot of interesting games. And it's going to be interesting to see how Gukesh improves his rapid and blitz because the narrative around Gukesh is going to be very similar to the narrative that was around Fabiano Caruana when he was uh, rising to the ultra elite classical status and contending for the world championship is, can he play the fast time controls? Not only because you have to be a universally strong player, you also need rapid and blitz to break the tie in the event of a tie in the classical portion of the world, of the world chess championship. Okay, so knight to h5, knight h2, bishop e2, queen e2. I think this Korean cold brew that I had is hitting different. Ed, ed. Also, I deadlifted 255 pounds today. So if anybody's been watching any of my socials, 
Last week, I did 245 three times. Today, I did 255, despite being sleepy and having bad allergies. But you didn't ask about that, but you clicked on this video, so you're kind of subjected to whatever I want to talk about. Night 2E396, and uh, Wei Yi was like, a, w was like a surgeon. He was like a composer. I mean, it, 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 Wei Yi manages his time really well. He's creative offensively and defensively, and he's so tough to beat. Like, he controls the game. Look at, look at the position on the 15th move, okay? Both guys at two minutes, relatively balanced game. And then by like the 25th move, it's 112 to 27 and Wei Yi is completely winning. And uh, he just puts pressure so well. Knight, it, look, look at the knight, bro. It went D5, F4, D3. And Gukesh is down to less than 10 seconds. His position is crumbling. He loses a key pawn in his position. Rook E4, Knight G4. And... Uh, it's just a matter of time. You take on E3. White has lost the defender over here. And while Magnus is going on that streak, where he's like, ah, 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 until they got paired. And I think the winner of this game is going to win the event. I mean, that's just what's, that's right. I, I, I don't think that's a crazy thing to say. So, Magnus early on plays a ready. Very principled approach by Wei Yi. We have e4, takes, takes, queen d1, rook d1. By the way, small side note. I'm going to look this up really quickly. I don't think Magnus uh, and Wei Yi have played much. Because Wei Yi is just, I mean, he's not in chess all that often. So these guys have played, including all three games of this event, they have played 12 games against each other ever. So before this event, they had played nine times. That's it, which is, on, which is crazy. Um, now, uh, Magnus has a good score against Wei Yi. He does. But a lot of those games were pre-2020. They, they played a lot in, uh, in, in random events, but it was like 2016, 2017. Like, Wei Yi, when, in 2016, is like 17 years old, right? So, they haven't played a whole lot, right? Now, Magnus plays this game very slowly, very positionally, knight to d2, and Wei Yi castles queenside. And from the opening stage, uh, it was, uh, it, it was black, who might have been able to, to argue that he has a slightly better position, all right? A5, Wei Yi played aggressively, Magnus played bishop b3, a4, knight bd2, and look at this, Wei Yi's just better with black. Now, if Wei Yi played energetically here with the move f5, he might have capitalized on that. f5 trying to destabilize the white center. If pawn takes f5, black takes like this, maybe starts fighting over here, controls the center. But Wei Yi played a little bit slowly, he played bishop f8, and sensing this hesitancy, Magnus completely took over. And suddenly, that's it. Dominance will be reasserted. White is just going to march down that queen side, get the win. That's going to be that. But Wei Yi starts fighting back. Protect his king. Creates counterplay. Suddenly, Magnus' advantage is nearly gone. What? It was like plus one. Yeah. Well, apparently, in this position after b4, knight d7, I, I, it's not even clear to me what Magnus did incorrectly. This doubling move apparently was wrong, which seems very natural. Uh, the computer just kind of wants White to hang out and not commit his rooks. Well, I mean, I don't know about that. Nobody really has any, you know, access to this to the computers in the games. Uh, but uh, rook a3, and suddenly Wei Yi is 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 fine. He's protecting all the important squares of his position. D5, and, and but, but he is down a minute. He's down a minute, and now you're entering that final phase of the game, that endurance phase. That endgame sharpness face. Rook a8. Look at this. Rook d8. Defending himself. Magnus keeps asking questions, but Wei Yi is right there playing defense. Kicks Magnus's knight out of the position. It's an equal rook and knight endgame. King e2. And now Wei Yi is up on the clock. He's up on the clock. And he plays f5. Now, f5 is a mistake, but Magnus doesn't punish it. And now h4. Bro, this man Wei Yi straight up playing for a win with black. What? He takes. Rook a shade. Magnus takes and plays rook g1. And now there's a very tense moment because you want to take this pawn if you're Wei Yi, but how are you going to make it happen? Because rook g5. And now if you play king e6, I save the pawn and then I save my rook and I'm a pawn up. I mean, it's very ugly, but it's apparently the right way to play. But Wei Yi should have gone for that. Instead, he takes on h4. And now look at this, rook f5. You can't take. And I think this move startled Wei Yi because he took on h3. Here comes Magnus. And then right here... Just a disastrous mistake. Magnus creating uh, seventh rank problems for black. Knight f6, knight e4. And here rook f6, rook, rook g6. Uh, and uh, they repeat it once. And 
I mean, naturally you go king e7 here, but then I guess rook d5, rook b5. So rook d6, rook h2, and my friends, it took some 60 moves. But Magnus crashes through, picks up a fork here because Wei Yi blunders. He only had five seconds remaining. And Magnus wins another game. And Wei Yi had a setback here. He had a setback against uh, Duda. So Magnus is roaring. He is still going for first place. This game is out of the way. Now it just comes down to will these guys beat everybody else? Vincent Keimer versus Magnus Carlsen. We have a double Fianchetto system by Magnus. D5. This is the critical approach. Trying to take space away. Magnus zips his knight into the C5 square. C6. D6. Very solid position, but how on earth is Magnus going to play this for a win? It's not winnable. I mean, you just white plays rookie one, right? Nope. Okay, we trade. Queen d7, looking to go to b7 at some point. There it is. Queen f3. Look at Vincent. Vincent's like, yo, I know Magnus has to win. I'm just not going to let him. I'm going to trade his pieces. He can't. Look at how is Magnus going to win this position? He can't win. Knight f94. Okay. I can take it, by the way. I, I will take it. Because if he takes on b2, I'm going to take on c5. And this is a dead draw. Dead draw. I mean, White will just play like rook d3, rook d1, vibe, right? Can't win this, can't lose this. Not possible. Knight e1. Okay. A4, solid. Whoa. Magnus gives up the bishop for the knight. He says, Vincent, let's play a rook end game, bud. Let's play a rook end game. You know I like those. I'm going to plant that rook right in your face is what I'm going to do. And in this position, it's actually already kind of challenging to figure out how to even deal with this pressure, rook b4 creates a lot of different problems, and this is going to happen, and black's king is going to get in. Pressure is building. Look at that move, d5, giving up a pawn to play c4 and cb3, and now Vincent has to be extremely accurate. The pawn has arrived on b3 like a hydraulic press, pushing those rooks back to the back rank. Rook c8 check, rook c5, and Magnus starts cleaning up, and suddenly he's up a pawn. Suddenly Vincent has four seconds versus 40. Takes, takes. It's four on four, but black has an outside passer. The engine might be able to hold this with perfect play, but the guy sitting playing with the white pieces is not an engine. His name is Vincent Keimer. He's a very talented young man. And now we just have chaos. A3, takes, takes, rook A1, and now the black king marches to help, hides behind the pawn, rook, B rook B1, rook B3, that's it. I've made it. My pawn's gonna promote. White is not fast enough. With his own pawns, rook e6, he sacrifices the rook, he tries to create counterplay, but it's simply too little, too late. By the way, he didn't push because he would have just been stopped, if anybody's confused. Rook f3, rook h3, rook g3, uh, and uh, that's it. It's gonna be checkmate. If anybody's confused, again, I give you check. I go rook h7, g5. Vincent gets close, but unfortunately not close enough. And Magnus Carlsen has won yet another game. But despite losing to Magnus, Wei Yi would not go away. Playing against Anish Giri, he plays a Yo Mama London. C5, E3, take, take. It's called a Joe Baba London, but funnier to call it my way. Knight C6. All right, we have a very solid game by Black, putting his pawns on the light squares. Wei Yi also going a bit positional. All right, nice and solid game. Both guys just trading. I mean, Anish Giri didn't have a particularly great event, but still always very dangerous. This game was no exception. He had a fantastic position, and then here he went for a tactic. Knight takes a4. So if rook takes a4, black would play queen d4. And you can't take the queen because you lose your queen. If you take the rook, you lose like this. So knight takes a4 played, but b3, oh my. That's a fork. You take here. Whoa. So the queen is hanging, rook is hanging, knight is hanging. What do you take? Take the rook, of course. But now the knight is hanging. So the knight's got to go here. But now I play rook a3. Knight's got to get out. I take on d5. And now Wei Yi has to, like, he's got to pick up some of the stuff here. It's all kind of loose, kind of hanging. Rook b5. And he's, he's doing a nice job here, putting some practical pressure. And he goes to this endgame. This is just winning because black has two major weaknesses and rook and these three versus knight and these three is winnable. It's, it's, it's very winnable. And there's a lot of problems for black on the defensive side. So now it's just a matter of cleaning up. 
So he's gonna get to the other pawn as well. It's it's you cannot stop it. I mean you can you could yeah, there we go. So he's gonna get to the other pawn. And now it's a question of is this a win or is this a draw? And I think very quickly we find out the constant threat of the sacrifice. He's threatening to sacrifice the rook for the knight and win a pawn because three versus two is winning in a pawn endgame. King d5, rook a3, and you just dominate the knight. You dominate the knight, you constantly threaten to capture it, you walk your king in, and there we go. That is the configuration you're looking for. Black is forced to make a pawn move, and now black is just out of moves. Black is out of moves. King to e6, rook a8, black can't move a thing. You can take, take, you still can't move here, rook g8. That's the major idea. Then I'll pick up the pawn on f5, and once I pick up this pawn, you will lose the rest of your pieces, because on the next move, you have to lose a knight. Then you will lose everything. Wei Yi was not done. Magnus was winning literally every single game he was playing. That's not an understatement. That's not an overstatement. I, whatever, I, under, over. Back to Magnus. So Wei Yi's winning also. Magnus is winning every game. There's no way, I mean, somebody's got to stop this man, right? So we play C4, D4. Magnus plays a reverse Benko Gambit. This is, this is the level that we're at. Again, Benko Gambit with black. C4, C5, D5, B5. Black sacrifices the B and A pawn in a queen's pawn opening to open up the B and A lines. Very interesting opening, very imbalanced. Um, I don't particularly love it because I don't like to just play down a pawn, especially when I'm black, but look at this. Same thing, B4. Same exact concept, CB, A3, boom. Same type of position. So basically Magnus is playing black, but he's playing white. So because he's playing white, he's getting a tempo up in the opening because he's he goes first. Okay, D3, E5. Now he's gonna wait a little bit. He finally takes back. Uh, we're not gonna get a, we are gonna get a queen trade. Wow, Magnus is just down a clean pawn, but he's just gonna put pressure. That's what he's gonna do. And basically he's gonna say, you can't guard me. He's gonna do this. He's gonna win a game and he's gonna do the too small motion in basketball, you know? Like when you, he's too small, he just can't guard me. God, can you imagine? That would be so funny. Rook b1, rook b8, brings his knight, a6, f4. Look at that, poking at the center, looking to take and to take. We have knight g4 by Duda. We have pawn takes on e5, dislodging a defender of the black center, knight f3, and just slowly b5. Okay, very, very important moment, but look at Duda. Duda's down four, uh, three minutes on the clock. It's a very important moment here for Magnus not to overcommit. He's got to create practical chances for his opponent to mess up, not to do something good. Rook d6, e3. Defending. Maybe c5 is an idea. You can't take because you're pinned. Black plays rook c8. Take, take. Knight b5. Okay, now, now Magnus is a pawn up. So the opening worked perfectly. He won the pawn. He's doing great. Now how is he going to win this position? Rook b3. Friendly reminder. Uh, if you go to an endgame, like let's say knight d4, and you go to an endgame, you might lose this. Like, this is a very losable endgame, because it's four versus three, I have a pass pawn, I'm gonna slowly go up the board. So black has to trade the right way. One pair of rooks is fine, and Duda is defending. Duda is very good. He is very good. He's a very good defender. He's very creative as well. Very practical. All of that is to say he has nine seconds on the clock. And uh, just like the, the many men before him, he might do something goofy. You can't take that pawn, by the way. You cannot take this pawn because of rook to d7. And then knight e5 is a fork and you win. So king c6, he doesn't, he doesn't plunder that. Bishop e6, rook a6. But again, you can only do so much when you have no time. Rook d6, he wins this. And now all Duda has to do is win this pawn. Now with the rook, he can trade it. Rook and knight versus rook is a draw. But Magnus is not going to let him trade it. Look at this. And now he's going to put the rook on g6. Well, well Duda's still looking for a way. Rook here. Uh-oh. Knight d4. Knight e2. I mean, that pawn is just... that. Literally, that is the only thing surviving in the position. King e3. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, Magnus gave away the pawn. No, he didn't. Because this. But rook h3. But this is a counter check. King f5. Oh, that's it. Duda's made it. Rook a5. Rook a4. Why, why didn't he take? Why didn't he take? Now rook f4 check. And rook a... Ooh! And now you lose. Duda hallucinated. He just hallucinated. He, he just forgot. I mean, he must have thought he was getting mated or something. He must have thought something. Duda just... He just went back to f5. And now Magnus wins. Because you stop the pawn from being taken, and you win Black's pawn. And now you win. Oh my goodness. An unbelievable turn of fortune there. No, but I mean, this is what happens. I mean, in chess, you, you earn your luck. 
You know, sometimes this is what happens. There's just nothing anybody can do to stop you. And guess what? Absolutely nobody could do anything to stop Wei Yi. I mean, at this point, they were just taking all his pieces. <laughs> like, two games ago, Anish Giri played in a way with black, and, 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 and Wei Yi played in a way with white, where, like, you just trade the pieces. Like, you just, you just go for a position where white can't do anything. And here is no different. They're just trying to play simple chess. They're not trying to calculate that much. They're playing a Queen's Gambit decline, very solid. Arjun's like, with less pieces on the board, I can't lose. All right? I can't do anything goofy. I'm just not going to let Wei Yi get active. I know Wei Yi likes to be active. I'm just not going to let him be active. All right? Wei Yi, meanwhile, is just stalling. By stalling, he gets himself into a slightly worse position. And now Arjun has to pounce, okay? Because you got to play the best move. So he pounces, right? Takes, takes, targets the pawn on c6, but now Wei, Yi, Wei Yi's got an open and active board to operate with. We have bishop d5, queen d5. You lose the pawn on b4, but suddenly counterplay is being created. Knight f6. No, but this is just fantastic from Arjun. What? Arjun sacrificed his queen. And I think what Arjun had calculated was rook a8, rook c8, rook c8, rook c8, king h7, knight g5, king h6, knight f7 check, and wherever the king goes, rook h8 is mate. So take, check, here, here, king h7, knight g5, king h6, knight f7, king h7, rook h8 is mate, and if king h5, rook h8 is mate. All of that makes perfect sense. All of that makes absolutely perfect sense, except knight f7 is protected by the queen. I mean, this is it. This is what we're dealing with late in a blitz tournament. You just deal with the fact that these gentlemen make the same mistakes we do. And guess what? Yesterday there was mate and ones not being spotted. And now Arjun has to go here. And maybe he thought, he thought he was still winning. Maybe he thought he saw all of this and was like, oh, I'm, I'm still winning because how does he stop Rook H8? Yeah. He stops it in a very heartbreaking way. The craziest thing is, like, Knight H7, Rook H8, I mean, how do you, how do you survive this position? You survive this position because there is a sequence of moves that wins. Uh, and the sequence of moves that wins, if you play rook h8, is queen to e3. I take the pawn with a check, and I win the knight, and then there's no mate. I mean, it looks like it's, it's game over. Black is completely mated. Noth nothing can be done. Check. Whoops. Check. If this or this, you take, and then you take. If this, you force the queen. King up. Take, and then you take. And suddenly... Arjun realized he was losing. This is just a losing endgame. And that's it. I think they played a little bit more, but Arjun resigns. Unbelievable. This was the position. Arjun was a clean pawn up. Up a minute and a half. He gave up the rook, the queen for the rook. He thought this was mate. He surrounded the black king, and he completely didn't realize there's queen e3, and the pawn is won no matter what, and so is the knight. But it all came down to the efforts of one heroic man, and that man, the Norwegian man, Magnus Carlsen. Gukesh, Magnus. Gukesh had an interesting game against Magnus in the Rapid. I think he lost yesterday to him in the Blitz. Bishop g7, bishop h3, and Gukesh takes with this pawn. This is, all, this is always what the computer recommends, to use the g file and then f4, f5. I've played like this with white. I don't understand it at all. We get a closed position. And uh, now Magnus, you know, has to win. And the craziest part is, in this position, Gukesh sacrifices the rook! Rook to g6! This isn't an unbelievable move, rook g6, because after bishop, after here, here, king e7, f5, is, 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 that's it. I mean, you resign. This is made. I mean, it's not made, but you lose all your pieces. So rook g6, oh my god. Both Magnus and Wei Yi are under tremendous pressure. Now, knight c4 by Magnus... You, see, you notice he spends one minute. I mean, rook g6 is, 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 a, is a lights out kind of a move. A lights out kind of move. Black actually has to sack the knight back to enable the capture and then put his king on d7. Actually, this looks relatively reasonable. 
But Magnus plays knight c4, and now Gukesh is winning if he takes the knight, which is so counterintuitive. Because what about the rook? Yeah, you just go back. It's not going anywhere. Rook g8, rook g1, queen g2, all these moves. So Gukesh goes here, tries to hang the bishop, because if you hang the bishop, rook e6 is a perpetual check, by the way. Here, here, queen g5. Not, not a perpetual, but at least the king is surviving. Uh, so knight e5. Oh my god. Look at this, knight e5. And now Magnus finds this key idea. Gukesh plays rook back to g3. Magnus very quickly trades all the pieces and says, well, at least now I can't lose. <laughs> rook f1, bishop to d6. All of Magnus' pawns are on the light squares. We're not going to count the a7 pawn. King b1. He castles long. King to b7 protects everything. And Gukesh just doesn't have enough pawn mobility. He's trying to do something with the pawns. He's trying to do something with the pawns, as you can see. But he's down too many of them. Rook c8. Oh, but suddenly, maybe some question marks. Queen e3, pawn takes on a4, but it's too little too late. Magnus cleans up, three pawns up, and uh, he's going to get to the white king. Both pawns are running. Look at that move. S the king slides out of the way to enable the movement of the rook. I mean, what a back and forth game. Magnus ended the blitz tournament by drawing his last two rounds. That's all he needed, even with the heroic efforts of one way Yi. The final standings are 26 points for Magnus, 25 and a half for Wei Yi, and then the rest of the field. Fantastic job, by the way, from Jan Krzysztof Duda, who was like the second or he was the third oldest player in the field. Literally, by the way. It's kind of nuts if you think about it. It's like Magnus and Anish. Magnus is the only player in this field above the age of 30, dinosaur. Anish is 29, also old AF. Uh, and then uh, Kirill is maybe young 20s. Duda, I think, might be like 27. 28, and uh, Wei Yi's 24, and then the rest of the players are like 20 and, and under. Um, okay, I mean, a couple of interesting storylines. First of all, Wei Yi is a, is a chess god. Uh, I don't know what's going on with this man, but looks like he's re-emerged. Wei Yi was the youngest 2700 ever. So, y'all may not know this about him because you don't, you've only followed the chess world recently. He re-emerged recently. He now won a classical tournament, and he's gotten second in Rapid and Blitz. He would have won this event. If Magnus Carlsen, like, rolled his ankle on the way to the playing hall. I mean, it's unfathomable. Magnus himself started slow, won the event 10 in a row. Just completely unbelievable. Unrivaled greatness. Seven tournament wins in a row. Ten wins in a row in this tournament. He does it for the content. I mean, Magnus, I would, uh, I would give you a hug, all right? If you were right here uh, for the content. Because you start the tournament, you're, like, in third or fourth. And then you're losing games. And you say you suck. And then you win ten games in a row. I mean, it's beautiful. You give me the, the bad and the good. Wei Yi is unbelievable. Uh, Prague just cooking everybody. Arjun cooking everybody. Nojebrak had a mid-tier result. Gukesh in last. Now, you could hit the panic button here, or you could say he has a lot on his shoulders to worry about. It's classical chess. It doesn't matter uh, that he's not doing well in Rapid and Blitz. You gotta be a universal player, though. I really think that to be an ultra-elite top five player, especially once Magnus starts leaving, which doesn't seem like it's gonna happen anytime soon, you gotta be good at all the formats. So we'll see how Gukesh continues to improve. He's obviously a monster in classical, but he has room to grow in Rapid and Blitz. Hasn't played in a lot of these online events, but we see, we'll see if he will. That concludes the first Grand Chess Tour tournament of the year. The storyline is Wei Yi, but Magnus came in right at the end and stole the spotlight. Ten straight wins, seven tournaments, one in a row. Get out of here.